All right, we're in lesson number five, the book of Ephesians. Especially the first chapter, there's an extremely long paragraph there. We might want to review some of the things that we've talked about before we get into that. Just some main points that Paul the Apostle has made in this, in this letter so far. So number one, Paul has greeted and complimented this church, this congregation in Ephesus for their faithfulness. Not all churches were faithful. Many of them had problems that he had to address. But Ephesus has been faithful and, um, and Paul compliments them on that. Uh, he also explains to them that God's purpose before the beginning of time was to create and bless the church with all the blessings that exist in heaven. A pretty grand opening statement. Everything that God has prepared as a blessing from the beginning, from before the beginning of time, He wants to lavish it on the church. That was His purpose. Number three, He says, uh, He goes on to name and describe these spiritual gifts. And we've, we've talked about these already, but basically what He said, these are the gifts that are waiting uh, to be given to the church. One, purity and innocence bestowed on those in the church. And when he says purity and innocence, in other words, purity and innocence not earned, but given as a gift. Uh, the adoption as children of God. Uh, another uh, blessing, forgiveness for sin, insight into God's plan. Insight into God's plan. God's plan was to save them, and to unite them, when I say them, I'm talking about the church, and to unite them to himself. Man could not figure that out on his own. God had to reveal that plan. It's one of the blessings. We have insight into, if you wish, God's end game. Uh, another a blessing, the ability to give and to be praised. I mentioned last time that the church not only gives praise to God, but the church also, by its very existence, is praise to God. Um, possession of the Holy Spirit, talked about that, saying, it's, why, why is it important to possess the Holy Spirit? Well, it's through the Holy Spirit that we're resurrected from the dead. So in that way, it is a great spiritual blessing. And of course, the assurance of resurrection, the assurance of glorification, and the assurance of exaltation. Three things that happen after we die. Resurrection, glorification, our, our physical bodies are transformed into a spiritual body that enables us to exist in the spiritual dimension. None of us would think of actually going to the moon you know, without a spacesuit, because this physical body is not designed to exist on the moon or on the sun or on Saturn. Well, in the same way, this physical body is not able to exist in the spiritual realm. So God says, I'll give you a new body. I'll, we call it glorified. I'll give you a new type of body that will enable you to live and exist in the spiritual dimension where God exists. And then exaltation. Not only a new body, but a new position. We're exalted to the right hand of God, meaning we have an intimate relationship with God, not based on our sinfulness. Right now we have a relationship with God based on our sinfulness. In other words, He forgave us for our sins. He sent Jesus to die. But in heaven, our relationship is not based on our salvation. It's based on our relationship with Him. Okay, another thing he does, he continues his prayer to include the request that God enable them to know him more intimately, to see more clearly the assurances or the hope that they've been given, to recognize the source from which comes all of these blessings and also to perceive the glorious end that Christ and his church were to experience. In other words, Paul prays that God will enable the Ephesian church to begin to taste, to begin to actually experience the things that are coming in the future. A lot of people say, well, I can't wait to get to heaven 
because you know, uh, we'll have this, we'll have that, you know, I, I'll experience a different thing. And Paul is saying you can start experiencing that now. Not the complete experience because we're limited because of our sinful and weak human uh, bodies. But it's not impossible to begin actually experiencing a taste of heaven. You can start now and one of his prayers is, God, please enable them to begin experiencing what is to come. Now, these were a few, uh, excuse me, there were a few lessons that we could draw from um, this passage concerning these spiritual blessings. Again, a bit of a review. First of all, we said that spiritual blessings are only available if one is united to Christ through faith expressed in repentance and baptism. That was one of the, that's where the spiritual blessings are. They're in Christ. They're for those who are related to Christ through faith. And that faith we talked about is expressed in repentance and baptism. Second lesson, spiritual blessings are far more valuable than material blessings, but are given to us freely by God. Here on earth, we earn everything we have. We earn it, we have to work for it. But spiritual blessings, which are even more valuable than the things we have here on earth, we don't earn those, they're given to us freely by God. And thirdly, spiritual blessings are received through faith, but they are appreciated and enhanced through prayer. If we have all the blessings, but we're not enjoying them, it's usually because our prayer lives are weak. Spiritual things are tasted and contemplated and experienced in the dimension of prayer while we are here on earth. In the future, we'll experience them at all times, not just while we're in a state of prayer or in a state of you know, uh, meditation or a state of study of the word. So in his prayer in chapter one, Paul describes the blessings that God has prepared for the church through Jesus Christ. In chapters two and three, He's going to describe the universal nature of the church. He's going to address the past of the church, the present of the church, and the future. And so we are in chapter two. Now in the last verse of chapter one, Paul refers to Jesus Christ as the head of all things. And it's something that he explains in more detail in the letter to the Colossians in chapter 1 verse 15, you know, in, in Colossians he talks about Jesus as head over creation, head over the spiritual world, head over the church. He goes into a lot more detail about Jesus' position in the book of Colossians. In the book of Ephesians he simply summarizes this idea by referring to Christ's rule in heaven, rule over all things, and headship over the church in chapter 1 verse 22. We talked about that last time. Very much like Colossians, this imagery of Christ as the head over the body, which is the church, is used as a kind of a bridge to transfer from one set of ideas, you know, a prayer for the blessings. He needs to get to another idea here, so he uses the idea of Christ as head as like a bridge to go from one set of ideas to another set of ideas. And one set of ideas are a prayer of blessing, the next set of ideas are the nature of the church. Okay? And so we leave chapter one's discussion of the blessings and we move on to a broad teaching about the church, which is actually the theme of this letter. So the first element that Paul will discuss is the church in time, human time. Okay? The past of the church, the present of the church, the future of the church. And he begins by describing the past condition of every member of the church before they became part of the body of Christ. So chapter two, verse one, he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Well, that starts it off well, doesn't it? And you were dead in your trespasses and, in your trespasses and sin. The word dead here means to be separated. The Greek word translated into English for dead means to be separated. In this case, separated from God. You need to understand the idea of separation. Imagine a nice tree, healthy tree, full of 
leaves and so on and so forth. And imagine if you went to that tree and you cut a branch off, a nice big fat branch, and you just cut it off and laid it to the side of the tree. And then you examined the tree and the cut off branch. You would notice that both are probably exactly the same. The leaves on the tree are green, the leaves on the cut off branch are green. The bark on the tree is healthy and thick, the bark on the cut off branch is healthy and sick. Uh, healthy and, 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 and well colored. The, the buds on the tree are, are, are budding, there's some buds there. You look at the branch that's been cut off, it also has some buds. So just to look at it, they both look the same. But we know what's going to happen, right? That tree is going to continue to flower and bloom and produce fruit and produce leaves and so on and so forth. But what's going to happen to that branch? With time, the leaves that were green are going to start to turn brown and brittle and dry. And if we wait long enough, there won't be anything left on that, tr uh, on that branch. It'll, uh, you know, it'll, be, it'll crack up, it'll just completely decay. Why? Because it's cut off from the tree which gives it life. The idea of spiritual death is like that. People are cut off from God and for a time, they look like they're like completely alive. They're walking around, they're producing children, they're building buildings, they're saving up money, they're laughing, they're enjoying themselves. You, know, you can't tell the difference. Except at one point, those who are in the tree, those branches that are in the tree continue to live. And those who are cut off, eventually they begin to die away. And that's what Paul is explaining here. Everyone, he says, who has come into the church at one time in the past were a cut off branch. We're dead. We're walking around, but they were, really, they were really dead. And so he continues in verse two, and he says, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So in verse two he explains why they were dead. They were dead, they were separated because their lives were governed in the past by three principles, three main principles. One, the course of this world. So Paul is saying that men who are separated from God live according to the principles of this world whether they be good principles or bad. Not all principles are bad, but they are principles of this world. The problem with this is that the world and its systems, its philosophies, whatever philosophy you want, humanism, existentialism, pragmatism, whatever ism that you want, that system does not have the power to regenerate your soul. Systems, human systems, have the power to give you some guidance in life, this life, but none of them have the power to regenerate, to give life to that cut off branch, if you wish. So he says men are cut off from God because they're following the course of this world. Secondly, they're cut off because of the prince of power of the air. Men serve one of two authorities. Those separated from God uh, serve Satan, whether they realize it or not. There was a, a singer who, who wrote this song called um, uh, Everybody Serves Somebody. Everybody Serves Somebody. And it was a very clever song because in the song, the writer says, you're either serving God or you're serving Satan. Okay. And the goal of Satan is to keep us away from Jesus Christ in any way he can. And then thirdly, he says, people are cut off because of the spirit of the sons of disobedience. In other words, men separated from God follow the spirit that is within them. You hear that all the time, right? Follow your heart. If you watch any of those uh, reality shows, there's contests, whatever, and they, all, they always have those heartwarming backstories, you know what I'm saying, about you know, they were poor, or you know, I'm, I'm singing this song for my grandma, you know, something like that. 
And then the most profound wisdom that ever comes out of this and say, well, I, I, I'm just going to follow my heart. And I cringe when they say that. I'm just going to follow. That's, this is the deepest wisdom of this world. I'm just going to follow my heart. But man is doomed without God's leadership. In Proverbs 14, 12, the writer says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. If you follow your heart only, the Bible says you'll, you'll miss the target. If you follow your heart, you won't find the narrow way. You'll find the broad way, but you won't find the narrow way. And so in verse three, Paul continues, he says, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even the rest. So Paul was speaking of Gentiles, but now he includes himself and the Jewish brethren at Ephesus when he describes the outcome of this style of serving the world, or serving Satan, or serving self. The outcome, Paul says, was that they searched only to satisfy their earthly desires without regard for God. When he says slaves of the flesh, he's not talking about you know, uh, people just involved in sexual immorality. He's, the flesh means you're only following what's in your mind and in your heart. And because of this, uh, because of this type of idolatry, because if you're not worshiping God, if you're following your own flesh, you're, it's a kind of idolatry. Because of this and sinfulness and ungodliness, they're all subject to the wrath of God's judgment. So Paul summarizes what the human condition of those who were not members of the church was before they entered the body. In other words, everybody in the church shared the same past, including us. We all share, the, it's, one of the, it's one of the things that binds us together because no matter if somebody comes from another state or another country, has a different language, has a different experience completely, we all share the same past. We all did what Paul is talking about here until we heard the gospel and responded to it. So now in verses four to seven, he's going to talk about the present and the future. In verse four he says, but God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, I'm going to stop there, he says but here, but. He has described man's hopeless situation and now he goes on to say what God has done about this situation. I'm going to skip over less, uh, verse four just for a minute and we're going to read verses five and six where Paul explains what God did in the face of man's sins and then we'll come back to verse four. So go to verse five, he says, even when we were dead in our transgressions, you know, there's that dead branch, there's that cut off branch. Even when we were dead in our transgression, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So what did, what did he do, God? What did he do? Well, he made us alive again with Christ. That dead branch, he grafted us back into the tree, if you wish, if you want to use that analogy or that imagery. How did he do this? Well, those of you who were in the great doctrines class, you know how he did it, through redemption. That grafting back into the tree, there's a price for that, and Jesus paid that price on the cross. He paid the price for our sins. Now, God did not only make us alive again with Christ, he raised us up from the dead. How? Through resurrection. How? By giving us the Holy Spirit who will power that resurrection. What else did He do? Well, He set us with Christ in heaven. How? Well, He's given us a glorified body and He's going to exalt us to the right hand of God. That's how He's going to do it. Okay, now let's read verse seven. Keep all these ideas together now. He says, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So now Paul looks at what God has done from God's perspective. What has God done from his perspective in timelessness and eternity? 
We have to understand that in God's eyes, all of this business here, the, you know, the redemption, you know, paying off of our sins, and, and the resurrection, and the giving of the glorious body, and the exaltation to the right hand of God, from God's perspective, this is already finished. It's already complete. The faithful in Christ have already received all of the blessings and they are, right, they are already in heaven. That's hard for us to understand because we live with the restrictions of time and we perceive the process as it is being carried out step by step. We're creatures of time. You know, for us, there's past. We remember that. There's present now. I'm, you know, and then there's the future that we kind of look for and try to guess what's going to happen. But God is not restricted by time. You know, time, you know, He's outside of time. And so Paul here is describing what's going to happen to us from God's perspective and he's saying, it's already done, the, the, the game is over. God sees everything as already complete and Paul is trying to get his readers to see it from God's view in order to encourage them. Don't be discouraged, he says. Look, look at this whole process from God's perspective. It's already finished. You've already won. You're already there. You know, we watch those movies, time machine, somebody gets into a time travel machine, goes to the past, goes to the future. This is kind of what Paul is saying. Let's get into the time machine. Let's go to the future. Look, we're all there. We're all sitting at the right hand of God. We all have these glorified bodies. All right, we're going to get back in the time machine and go back to the present. So don't keep that image in mind. Don't be discouraged. Don't quit. OK, so let's go back to, the ver to verse 4, where Paul will explain why God did this. So let's go back to chapter 2, verse 4, read it again. It says, but God, being rich in mercy because of His great love, with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgression, made us alive together with Christ Jesus. By grace you have been saved. How many times has he mentioned the word love and grace and mercy? So why did God do this? Well, He blessed us with every spiritual blessing that includes redemption, rede uh, resurrection, glorification, exaltation. He did it because He is rich in mercy, because He is capable of great sympathy and empathy and tenderness and a willingness to forgive. He is the epitome of love. That's the thing that motivates Him to do what He does on our behalf. So God's mercy, His motivation, and God's love, that's the expression of His mercy, is free towards us. He is and does this because of who He is, not because of what we do. We keep trying to earn that. No, nah. He does it because He loves us. That God freely chooses to have mercy on us and arrange for our salvation, this is what grace is all about. All right, so we keep going. And the last couple of verses here that we have time for this morning, <clears throat> verses eight to 10, Paul makes a comment on what he's just explained. So he teaches and he comment, excuse me, he teaches, he explains, so on and so forth. He kind of deconstructs the whole idea of salvation and why it happened and what's going to happen, all that. And once he's finished doing that, he kind of steps aside and he comments on what he's just said. So in verse eight and nine, keep that context in mind, he's making a comment now. Verse eight and nine, he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. So let's stop there. First thing he says, he says, we have been saved by grace through faith, and explains that this is a gift of God, it cannot be earned with good deeds. Now many people have misunderstood and misused this verse of scripture. So let's look at, you know, let's look at the features. First of all, he talks about saved. You have been saved. Another word, you know, I like the word rescue a little bit better because saved has such, so much religious connotations. But when we say, oh, I was rescued, you know, we were up on the third floor and the fire was you know, was burning out of control on the first floor and the second floor. We couldn't go down. If we jumped out, we would be killed instantly. 
and they, 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 they sent a ladder or a helicopter and we were rescued. We kind of connect emotionally with the word rescued. So Paul uses that same word, saved, rescued. In one word, Paul compresses all of the blessings that he has described so far. To be saved or to be rescued, or to receive redemption, the resurrection, the glorification, the exaltation, all that is squeezed into one single word. And I've told you this before, this is how Paul writes. He explains something, gives a lot of detail, and then he takes all of it and he compresses it down to one single word that has a lot of power and a lot of meaning to the readers. So to be saved or to receive you know, a rescue means all the rest. So salvation is what we have. We've been rescued. And then he talks about grace. Grace is the reason that we have this salvation. We have it because God is gracious. Man cannot redeem his own sins, he can't regenerate himself, he can't resurrect his own body, he cannot transform himself gloriously, he cannot put himself at the right hand of God. He has no power over these things. God is the one that does this. He does this with His power because, why? Because He's powerful? No, because He's merciful. He does it as a favor. I'm going to do you a favor. Man cannot earn it, he can't pay for it, he can't produce these things in any way. He cannot produce it, but he can receive it. And then the third comment that he talks about here is faith. Salvation, that's what happens to us. Mercy, that's why it happens to us. Faith, faith is the condition. Man can receive the gift, and the condition that God places on the free gift is that man receives it by faith, not by works. You know, there are a lot of uh, debates all the time, especially you know, here, people are always debating like baptism. You know, Should you be baptized? Shouldn't you be baptized? You know, if, I, if I talk to some of our friends that, that go to church across the street there at the Baptist church, we'll eventually get to that and we'll debate you know, baptism. Do you know that in the New Testament, they never debated the, necess the necessity of baptism. It's never an issue, ever. No apostle, no teacher, even in the, even in the church history, you know, you, you're looking at church history, early church history, there was never a debate about the need to be baptized in order to become a Christian. The debate was always about, are we saved based on a system of faith or are we saved on a, by a system of works? That was the debate. That was the thing that was debated by Paul and, and Peter and other apostles. How do we, what's the condition that we receive these gifts? By faith or by some sort of ceremony, by some sort of perfectionism, by some sort of outward religious work? That was the debate that they had over and over again. So faith is the condition. And a lot of people say, oh, if there's a condition, it's a work, it's not good. But that's not a biblical idea. Let me give you an example. If you win a free car, you, know, you put your business card in the, in the, in the, in the fishbowl you know, at uh, Hudeberg, and they say, hey, we've got a promotion, we're giving away a free Impala. Just put your business card in there. And lo and behold, you get a call. Hey, you won the free car. The condition is that you have to come to the dealer in order to claim it. Sign the papers, claim the car. Is it still free? Well, yeah, it's still free. Even if there's a condition for you to take possession of it, it's still free. Man cannot produce his own salvation, but he is able to believe, and so God makes belief the condition upon which the gift is received. And so the Bible explains how that belief or how that faith is to be expressed properly. In Mark 16, 16 of course, he says those who believe and are baptized, they're the ones that are rescued or saved. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38, uh, Peter says those who repent of their sins and are baptized in the name of Jesus, they're the ones whose sins are forgiven. They're the ones who receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, 
to believe and to acknowledge our faith in Jesus, to repent, to be baptized in His name. Those are the conditions. So the big argument at this point is this. Some say, so long as you believe in God's grace and plan to save you through Christ, you receive salvation. You don't have to be baptized. That's just an afterthought. That's just, you do that simply as a kind of a ritual. We, in the churches of Christ, say that you must not only believe, but you have to express that belief in the way that God has commanded us to do so in His word. I tell people outside the church, uh, baptism in water by immersion is not a church of Christ thing. It's a Bible thing. We are simply respecting and submitting to what the Bible says. Your beef, if you don't want to be baptized, your beef is not with us. Your beef is with God's word. And we're not saying that smugly or in, in any prideful way. I mean, it's, listen, when God puts something down at least 10 times in a single book, you ought to be paying attention. And so Matthew and Mark and the book of Acts and Galatians and Ephesians, God repeatedly sets forth the conditions. So let's go back to our example, shall we? Let's say you got the call, you got the free car, but you go over to the Chrysler dealership and sit in the Chrysler dealership instead of the Chevy dealership at Hudeburg, you go over uh, you know, to the Chrysler dealership and you sit and you wait for your car to be delivered. Are you going to get the free car? No, why? Because you yourself have changed the conditions and you've gone over here. You won the prize, but you won't possess it because you haven't fulfilled the condition. And so Paul says that we obtain what would have been impossible for us to receive the rescue, the salvation, and all the stuff that comes with it. It would have been impossible for us to receive this because God chose to be merciful towards us and offer it to us on the basis of faith. Otherwise, there's no way we could have accessed it. And this faith is expressed in a way that everyone could do. It was fair. Repentance, everybody in the world can repent. Believe, everybody in the world can believe. It's not something that's beyond the human condition. Be baptized in water. Is 80% of the world covered in water? Do we have a problem finding water? So the conditions that God places on the expression of our faith are universal. Everyone has access to them. And so in verse 10, Paul concludes and he says, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so Paul looks at the situation from God's perspective and he says that in addition to creating the church for the purpose of lavishing all these blessings on them, in addition to that, he also created good works for the church to perform while it is here on earth. Not good works to earn heaven, we already have that. Remember what he said? He took us into the time machine and he brought us to the future and he says, look at you, you're right there, you're sitting right next to the, the throne of God, that's you, that's your future. And then we got back in the time machine, we came back to today. And Paul is saying, don't forget that image, don't forget that. Now, while we're here, he says, God has prepared good works for us to do. Not good works that, um, that will earn heaven, we have that, but good works so that God will be witnessed and glorified and visible to non-believers. I do what I do. It, you know, when I first uh, became a Christian uh, many, many years ago, um, I, had, uh, you know, I used to smoke cigarettes. You, most of you know that. You know, I, I was a smoker, I loved to smoke. I used, to, I used to eat in order to smoke. Anybody have a, a smoking habit? You understand exactly what I'm saying. I used to eat, hurry up and eat because I wanted to get to the cigarette that came after the meal. Finish a job in the garage, ah, light, light up. Finish mowing the lawn, ah, light up. 
be at work doing something. I, I, this is before I became a Christian, I was working in a company. Well, I finished the reports, all the reports are done for the day. Ah, light up. And then I became a Christian. And nobody preached on that. I just, I remember once I was smoking and, 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 and we were just at the office you know, where I was at. And the person said, oh, you're a Christian? Oh, I would have never known. <laughs> Wow, that was an eye opener. <laughs> so I realized that I was not giving a good witness for something that I deeply believed. So something had to go. Did I get rid of my witness or did I get rid of my cigarettes? Well, the cigarettes went. It wasn't a huge sacrifice. It was a tough couple of months, you know, but I realized I cannot continue to witness that I'm a believer, that I have this great gift, unless I give this thing up. And giving this thing up has nothing to do with me going to heaven. Giving this thing up has a lot to do with me saying to God, I really believe God. I really want to make a good witness. I don't want anybody not to believe because of me. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light shine before men in such a way. There, there's that such a way. Everybody gives off some sort of light, but let your light shine in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So, if I would meet some of my old friends who were not Christians, but who knew me back in the day, and they'd say, you know, here, have one where they're lighting up, say, no thanks, you know, I've, I quit. Really, why, it's a health thing, eh? And you say, ah, oh, you got to die from something, this or something else, who cares, you know? And that would be my opportunity to say, no, I've become a Christian and I've, I thought you know, that this was not consistent with what I believe. And usually they went, oh, <laughs> and the conversation didn't go anywhere else. But sometimes they'd say, oh yeah, you became a Christian? What's that all about? Let your light shine in such a way that you are glorified? Absolutely not. That your Father in heaven is glorified. So in the end, the church is a source of praise for God. And Paul is saying this is its present and future function. It is also the state and activity that gives each member its greatest joy. And so he summarizes here by saying, hey, God loves the church and the church loves others in order to witness for what God has done for all of us. All right, well, before we get into the next chapter, I don't think we have time. We're going to stop right there.